Hey guys, it's Tom Trier Holmes with the Fujinet Project, and I'm glad that everyone is having a fantastic holiday. I sure am, and I've been spending the time basically trying to get all of the various pieces of the Atom firmware and the uh, Fujinet software for the Atom into shape, and I want to take and show you what we've got so far. But first, for those who haven't seen, let's have a look and see what Fujinet actually is. And for that, I'm going to take and flip over to my overhead cam. Okay, so what is Fujinet? Well, this guy is Fujinet. We'll take and put that little AtomNet connector out of the way for just a moment. And you'll see it's a pretty small little device. You can see it's fitting quite easily in the palm of my hand here. Uh, we have on the top of the unit three individual actuated buttons buttons a b and c c functions as a reset and buttons a and b have different functions such as swapping the order of discs and enabling certain functions that we're trying to figure out what we want to take and map to it but suffice it to say that we've got three software control buttons that we can use to control various functions on the right hand side here, we have the uh, out connector for the Atom, but we also have a micro SD card slot in which can be put a fairly standard micro SD card. On the bottom, we have a USB A connector here. The intent of this is to allow for a USB keyboard to be connected. And I will be adding support in the firmware so that that will be possible. No, I don't think we'll be able to take and hook up devices like gamepads and whatnot. If for no other reason than those aren't AtomNet devices on an actual Atom. So, I don't know. But whatever we can come up with, it's here. These are connected directly to GPIO pins. So, if you can figure out a protocol to use on them, the connector is there for your use. Um, we have the input side here. And we have a power switch right here, so you can turn the unit on and off. Uh, we also have here a micro USB connector here. Uh, the primary use of this is so that you can hook up to a computer for development purposes, so you can flash your own versions of the firmware. And in fact, when you use the FujiNet flasher to update the device, this is what you'll be connecting up to the computer. But you can also use it as an external source of power if you want to keep the FujiNet running all the time. So you can just as easily plug this up to a power bank or a power transformer. Works just fine. Uh, you can also power it solely from the Atom itself. The uh, current draw on the Atom is negligible, and so it can perfectly take and power this device all by itself. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and do that right now. All we have to do to hook up the FujiNet to your Atom is to put it in the chain somewhere. And you'll notice that when we did that, it immediately powered up. And you'll see right here that there are three indicator lights here. Uh, this is for Wi-Fi, whether or not you're connected to Wi-Fi or not. This is for AtomNet activity. And this is, uh, sorry, this is for, uh, this is a secondary light for different functions. I'm using it, for example, to indicate when the printer is active. And this is the AtomNet indicator. Uh, but for the purposes of demonstration here, I'm actually going to take and hold down this button right here until it completely resets and keep holding it down as it resets so that we can temporarily take and zap the network parameters away from the device real quick so that we can show what happens when you boot this up for the very first time. Right now, it may look like all the lights are off, but the FujiNet is actually sitting and waiting for the Atom to take and boot. And so if we actually take and do that, we'll take and flip over to my full display here. I'll take and bring up our little display here. And if we take and boot it, you'll see that it boots the configuration program.
It scans for networks and gives you the opportunity to take and select one of them. Let's go ahead and select my home network and type in the password. Hold on. The keyboard is at an odd angle here, so this may take a moment. Once we've entered in our password, we successfully connect to the network, but you'll see that all the host slots and everything are empty. At this point here, I will take and go ahead and put away the FujiNet to the side for a minute so I can use the keyboard. We will take and just kind of put the video window off to the side for a minute. And I will take and press and edit a slot. Now, in the concept of FujiNet, you have what are called host slots. And these are places from which you can load software. Let's put one of them in. This is a host called atomapps.irata.online. You can also have a slot for your local SD card storage. And if you had something like a local file server, you could put it in here too. I have one here called TMA2. And so on. You can have up to eight of them. And it's easy enough to change them out. So with that, let's go ahead and see how easy it is to launch a game, for example. We'll select atomapps.errata.online from the host slots here. And you'll see it has connected to that server and has pulled down a directory tree, the top level directory. We can use either the uh, we can use either the arrow keys on the atom, or we can use the joystick as well. And my joystick's not plugged up, but yeah. Anyway, oops. But you can use the arrow keys and the joystick to take and do selections just fine. We'll take and press go into games, and I have a selection of example games here. You can see as it displays the file names here, it ellipsizes the middle of them so that you can see the beginning of the file name and the end of the file name. I thought this to be a good compromise here. One of the things that I'm going to be adding to config is the empty space down below will show the long form of the file name as well as you go over it. So you can see that these are tape images here. We'll take and pick Donkey Kong Jr. for example. But since we're just going to take and boot this guy up, I don't have I don't want to take and go through and go through the process of just putting it in slot one and then hitting boot. I can take and strip that down to a single step by pressing the six smart key here, which is mapped to quick boot. And within a few moments, Donkey Kong Jr. is loaded up. Here we go. Okay, great. So you can see right here, and in fact, uh, it's still loading the disk blocks and everything in the background. And as we load certain things, as we load certain things up and do certain things, the FujiNet indicator will take and come on and off as AtomNet activity happens. We'll go ahead and just kind of bring that into play here. Boom. Droid cam on, and it looks like my droid cam may have gotten deactivated from the cell phone. Yeah, no big deal. Let me see here just a moment. Sorry about that. Uh, my phone actually timed out, so it actually, uh, I had to take and reactivate it. No big deal. But as you can see, this works just fine. And if I take and hit the reset on my Atom again, since this is still mounted, it will take and load it again as you'll be able to see from the FujiNet here. So this isn't loading config right now, it's actually loading Donkey Kong Jr. again. And this is, yeah, like I said before, this is happening over the internet, over the cloud, directly to the FujiNet, uh, not off the SD card slot, it's happening over the network. Okay, so if we want to come back, all we have to do is hit the reset button. If we hit the reset button, you'll see the Wi-Fi indicator go off for just a moment and reset itself. 
it will automatically reconnect. And from now on, because you've got networking information in the FujiNet, it won't ask you for that networking information again. It will take and connect to what's already there and will present you with your host screen automatically. So we can take and connect other things as well. So let's say we want to do something a bit more complex. I can pull something off of the SD card slot, such as my uh, uh, eight megabytes CPM image here, and we can hit the return key. And we'll see some information about the file here with the opportunity to take and select a particular device slot that we want to put this into. Uh, we're going to take and put this into device slot number one. So I'm going to take and select that, and I'm going to press the six smart key to mount it read write. I can also take and use this opportunity to take and eject any disks and things that I don't want in the slot. So now CPM is sitting in, dri in disk drive one. And I'm going to go ahead and go over here, for example, to TMA2, to my local file server. And we're going to take and load up a copy of 8080 fig fourth build disk, just because. Why not? We'll take and select it. And this time, We'll either press the two key or hit the down arrow key to take and move it into place. You'll see that if we hit the tab key at this point, we can have the opportunity to take and look at what we have running down here or uh, move it across to the other slots, whatever. Tab back over to the host slots. And if we need to, for some other reason or not, we can also press the four key here to show the network configuration. And we have the opportunity to take and change the SSID to reconnect or to turn certain features such as the virtual keyboard and printer on or off. We'll escape out and we will go ahead and boot what we have here. You'll see the CPM coming up here. And I will say that uh, the disk access, particularly with DSK images, is not optimized. It will be faster. We can hit directory here. We see what's on drive A. And you can see not only the standard CPM utilities here, but you can see some additional stuff for controlling FujiNet functions inside of CPM. These are the FNC tools, and I will show you those in a moment. We go to drive B, we'll see what we also have mounted over here. And you can see that we can interact with the, the disks and data on the second slot here. All nice and neat. All right, we'll go ahead, we'll reset the FujiNet again, and we'll go back into config for a particular thing here. So bang, boom, boom, and on. You don't have to wait for it to fully connect, but you can. Now that we're back here, we'll go ahead and I will go hit tab here. And there's a particular feature. If you've noticed, this says clear to eject all slots. We'll press the clear key to do just that. Now those slots are clear and everything's nice and clean so we can take and do something else. Let's create a new disk, actually. Let's start off with, uh, for example, uh, we'll take and create, uh, we'll take and load up Smart Basic as an example. From the Langs folder here. And we'll go ahead, since we wanna do something else, we'll go ahead and go in if I go ahead and press return, by default, it will take and mount this read only. It's a nice convenience feature. So SmartBasic is now loaded into drive one. 
And if I then take and go to my local file server, for example, you'll notice that there is a key for insert to create it to create new. We press the insert key and we check the particular media type that we wish to create. I'll create a disk here and I will create a custom disk. And we'll say that that custom disk is 1,024 blocks in size, so roughly a megabyte. Sure, why not? Please enter a file name for this. It's a good thing here because we, de we detect on file extenders here to put the file extender for the appropriate file type here. So be a big .dsk. And we get the opportunity again to take and mount into the appropriate device slot. We press enter. And it creates the file for us. <clears throat> so you can see that on the FujiNet here, it is accessing the TNFS file server. TNFS is the uh, file standard that was created by the SpectraNet project for the ZX Spectrum SpectraNet interface, and we've borrowed it because it's a wonderful protocol to use for these smaller computers. Uh, it's easy enough to set up a TNFS file server, and there are pre-made images even for things like Raspberry Pis and network attached storage devices so that you can get up and running very quickly. There are even Docker containers, so you can run this on a server if you wish. So with that, once this is done, it will ask us one more question here once it's finished creating the file. And that is whether or not we want to take and turn this into an EOS image of some sort. Yes, let's write an EOS directory to it. And let's give it a, a volume name. We press return, it creates the directory sectors. And at this point, we can take and boot into Smart Basic. You can see we've booted into Smart Basic here. And if we do a catalog on D6 now, we'll see that we have a big disk and it is 1,022 blocks free. We can save something to it. So you can see right there working just fine. And you could see that we were able to take and create uh, disk images directly from inside the configuration program and mount them up ready to go at a moment's notice. And funny enough, we can actually take this uh, a bit further. So um, for this next bit here, we're actually going to go into CPM and look at the CPM utilities. Now, for that, of course, we're going to do the same trick we've always done and press the reset button. Yep. And go ahead and press the reset on the atom itself. And we're going to go ahead and just clear this out because we're done with this. Sure, if we tab over, and it looks like oop, looks like the virtual keyboard stuff may have gotten stuck here. Uh, let me try to take and do this again. And yes, since this is beta software here, we're still testing a number of features, such as the virtual keyboard feature. Uh, we are currently querying devices to see if they are active on the on the bus or not, and if they are, then we disable the functionality on the FujiNet automatically and as dynamically as possible, in the hopes that we don't have to have a configuration menu where you turn on and off certain devices to match your setup. We'll see how well that works in practice. But at least for now, we'll go ahead and we will clear our slots again using the clear key. 
and we will go to CPM. Mount it read right. And I think that's good for now. We'll take and just boot into this so you can kind of see what's going on here. Now you'll see that this particular CPM has drive B set up as a 160K disk. So for our test, that's what we're going to make our disk images for. No big deal. So if we look at some of the other files that are here from the usual suspects, we can see a number of files that begin with the letter F. These are the FujiNet command line tools or FNC tools as we call them. Uh, and they can be run from inside CPM to do the individual functions that normally happen at boot with config, but inside of CPM without having to leave CPM in the first place. For example, we can look at the network configuration using fInfo. Or we can look at the host slots that we have set up. Or the device slots that we have set up. And you can see right here with the device slots that we have set up here, you can see that we have CPM 2.2 mounted and we have it mounted rewrite and it's being mounted from host slot number one. And if you look a little closer, you can see, yep, a bit more of the file name there. It's all there, ready to go. Nice and easy and convenient. Not only that, but you can also take and mount disks using the fmount command. Now, because the fmount command needs to handle complex file names, we can't really do any command line processing for this tool. So we have to do it interactively. I think this is a good compromise, though. So for this, we'll take and go to my local file server here. And when we select it, you'll see that we have a list of files here with a, with a number for the particular file number. So if you know the file number of the file you're gonna, gonna get to, you can type it here at any time, or you can look through the list here, hit return, for example, look through the list, find what you're looking for, and then mount it. For example, we're going to take and mount file number zero, which is 8080 fig fourth 1.1 here. And we're going to mount it into slot two, which corresponds to CPM drive B. We're going to mount it as read only. And you'll see once we get back to the CCP here, it's as if we've inserted that disk in the drive. Conversely, we can also take and eject a particular disk from the slot. If you don't specify one, it will ask for one. You can also We'll take and do this again so we can see the other way that you can do this directly. Um, back to TMA2, we'll go ahead and mount this again. And this time we will do it from the command line because F eject can actually take command line parameters. We'll say we want to take an eject device slot 2. It will do it immediately without asking any questions. If we do FLD, we'll see that that is now empty. Not only can we do that, but we can create new disks on the fly as we need them using the fnu command. We'll take and create a new disk here on my local SD, on my local file server. And we're gonna make a standard 160K disk 
We can also specify a number of blocks if we wish to as well. Give it a file name, put it into device slot two. We get a confirmation here of every, all of our parameters. Are you sure? Absolutely. And it will create the disk for us. Now, currently it does not format it, uh, but by the time that you guys get the software and start getting it around, I will put in uh, formatting the CPM fill blight automatically so you won't have to do the next step. We can format the disk. And you can see it's just doing its thing. And Sure, we can, for, we can verify the media if we wish. And as you can see, it's just pushing along just fine. You can kind of see it blink as it takes and does each block as well. All good. Nope, we don't want to format another. Done. And if we look at drive B, We'll see we have a nice blank disk to work from. Now, for this next bit here, I'm actually going to use the virtual printer, but we need to take and do a little bit of uh, mounting so I can take and pull a little bit of some source code here. Nothing too big or fancy, just enough to work. So let's say, for example, uh, we'll take an F eject 2 again. And we're going to mount that copy of the source code. And we're going to take and print it out. So let's say, for example, OK, SD, da, 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 da. we're going to take and go back to my local file server here. Boom. And take and mount it back here. We'll mount it read only. We don't need any read write for this. And we will take and go to drive B, have a look. Oops. And we will see there's a copy of PIP on here, but there's also a copy of Pigforth and a few other things. And I will take and send Pigforth to the list device. And we will see as we do this, it will start streaming the data to the printer. You'll see the blinks start to change as we switch from block device to character device. Right there. And we're just sending data across. We'll wait here about 10, 15 seconds, and then I will take and hit control C to abort the process. I could have also taken an echo to the screen so I could have had some feedback, but you know, meh. Or hit control P and done a directory listing or something. But this is kind of just an idea, just to show you. So with that, if we hit control C at this particular point in time, we abort. And once the bust activity dies down here from our device, it will take and send it to the printer. Hopefully it will have done that. It may have done that so quickly we didn't see it. We shall see. Uh, so far, you know, I've been improvising well. Let's see how well this actually pans out in practice. I'm going to take and put you away. And I'm going to go to my web browser here. And we're going to open up a window. And you may have recalled 
that on my uh, host name, my host name is Adam Pujinet. If I take and do NF info, you'll actually see it. Host name for this guy is right now it's Fujinet. And the IP address is 192.168.1.23. I did have it set up as Adam Fujinet, but when I cleared it, it put it back to the default. No big deal though. Let's see if this works in practice. I want to try it real quick. Okay, so that's good. All right, good. So I'm going to take and move this out of the way for a moment. And if we go now to Fujinet, we will see our web admin here. I'm going to take and bring the uh, overhead cam out of the way so you can kind of see what's going on here. We have the web admin that's built into the FujiNet, which can be used for a variety of tasks, such as uh, you can select uh, files and things to mount directly from here as well, if you wish. Or you can eject disk slots here if you wish directly, if you wish. But most, most likely you guys are going to be using this to uh, select a particular emulated printer and to use it, and currently we have the Coleco Atom printer activated here. And we're going to go ahead, and there's a variety of different printers that can be used. And we're going to go ahead and see if it will pick up if this is going to work or not. Oh, well, here's something from here's something from the previous buffer. <laughs> I guess I'll put this over here. Yeah, so this was something that came in from Atom Calc here. Looks like I need to take and do a little bit of finagling now that the dynamic printer code is in place. But you can see this is essentially how you pick up your print your printouts. Click, boom, damn. And from that point, you can take and print them out. They're PDF files. Print them on your modern printer. Okay, so there we go. Um, let me see if there's anything else I need to take and show here before we go away. See if there's anything that I've missed that we need to show here too. Oh, there's also uh, there's also a command here for uh, for editing host uh, host devices and host interfaces. So, like say for example, I want to take and if I look at FLH and I see that I've got an empty host slot for number four, I can say for example. and set that particular host name, host slot, to four. Boom. At which point it takes and sets it. If we look, there it is. <laughs> if we take and mount it, we can go to it and immediately start pulling in files from there. I mean, you know, just if we want to, for example, boom. Maybe we want to take and pull in a copy of WordStar. Who knows? We can do that. Put that in Drive 2. Read only. Sure. Why not? At this point, we can take and copy it over. Cool. All right. All cool, I guess. Do a little load of WordStar over the network. Why not? One second, we'll go ahead and uh, serial port driver, huh, interesting. See if it'll finish loading here, yeah, all right. So there we go, we'll just go ahead and exit out. Why not, exit, ding, 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 and we're done.
So I think that pretty much ends it up here. I think this is a good place to end it. There's a lot more to come, but this is where things kind of stand right now, functional wise. Ooh, interesting bug there. It looks like CPM crashed. <laughs> Oops. So that is a good place to put to end it. <laughs> so I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Uh, we're trying to take and get everything sewed up as best as we can. Um, it, uh, we're going, it will be out by, uh, it, it will be out in the next couple of months for sure. Uh, there are already a number of beta devices out in the wild as people are testing, giving suggestions and working on the firmware. Uh, so that we can take and get this in a num in in ways that would be most beneficial to the Atom community. So if you've got something that you think would be better, if you've got a thing that you want to help, get in touch with us. We're more than happy to take and help, and we really want to take and make something wonderful for all of you guys. So until next time, guys, have fun. <laughs>